I recently returned from a sailboat race from Daytona Beach, Florida to Charleston, South Carolina. Along the way, my duties were watchstander, but also navigator, and we took some slight observations of the sun to serve as lines of position along the way. This was an electronic navigation race, so it wasn't a big deal, but we did take some observations, my friend Chuck and I, and I thought in this video it might be fun to reduce one of those by hand to show you the process from soup to nuts for a celestial sight reduction of the sun. You'll notice down below that there are timestamps for some of the key moments in this video. So if you do already know something, feel free to forward ahead to, uh, to stuff you're more curious about. But we are gonna go into pretty much detail about the background and all the five steps using this method of celestial sight reduction process. Let's first start with a little bit of background about lines of position in general and what they mean. When we talk about a line of position, we're just talking about some place on the earth that we know we are, or more specifically, where we were. Imagine a case in which you're floating out there on the ocean and you have a lighthouse on an island, and you want to help uh, figure out where you are using that lighthouse. Traditionally, on a chart, if this was a, a top-down view of that lighthouse, what you would do is on your boat, we're out on our sailboat and we have a compass. And I look across that compass and I see the lighthouse out there on a bearing. A bearing is a direction to a lighthouse, for instance. Uh, celestially, a bearing is known as an azimuth. So we'll come back to that later. But if I use my compass and I take a bearing of that lighthouse, I could then go onto the chart and draw a line kind of backwards from the lighthouse. And I know I'm somewhere on that line because if I look along the line, I see that the lighthouse is out there. So I could be close to it, I could be far away from it, but I know I'm somewhere along that line. That's not very helpful in terms of real navigation, I guess, but a single line of position is definitely a useful thing to get. Imagine a case in which there was two lighthouses. Well, then I could get two lines of position and I could get a fix from there. And a fix is where my ship was at a particular time. So lines of position just mean I'm somewhere on that line. And when we do celestial navigation, we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna do it for not the lighthouses on earth, but the lighthouses in the sky. I'd also like to ask you another question. Think about the case where you can see that lighthouse and you can see the base of the lighthouse as well. There's actually a couple other ways you can use this lighthouse to help figure out where you were. For example, if you had radar, you could bounce radar waves from the boat to the lighthouse and back using the speed of, of light, of transmission, of electromagnetic energy, you could figure out how far you are away from that lighthouse. So even if you did not have a second lighthouse, if you had radar, if you had radar, you could say, okay, not only am I on this line of position, but I'm this far away from the lighthouse because of my radar tells me. And then I've got to fix that way. So a single line of position and a circle of position, because I'm somewhere on that circle based on my radar time, gives me a fix. Likewise, we're gonna do something similar with celestial navigation, but not with the lighthouses on Earth, but with the lighthouses in the sky. So circles of position, lines of position, all helpful stuff when we're trying to figure out where we are or where we were at a particular time. Less common for terrestrial or land or water, you know, Earth-based navigation would be uh, using geometry to help figure something out. Because if you knew the height of this light, and they're always listed on the chart, and you had some tool to help you measure the angle between the bottom and the top of that light, you could create a little triangle here. And it's a right triangle. It's a right angle, assuming the lighthouse is built straight, of course. So if you could measure this angle right here, call it maybe theta, that's like a mathematical angle, and you knew this angle right here, and that means you can figure out this angle right here, and if you knew the height, if you think back to your geometry days, if you know two angles and a side or two sides and an angle, there's some rules that help you figure out the rest of it. And you can figure out your distance using that method. 
So we don't often do that in navigation because we've got radar and we've got charts and we've got compasses that give us lines of position which are easier. But this is a valid technique. And when you think about celestial navigation, we're not necessarily doing that, but the principle of triangles and angles and right angles and figuring out sides and everything is definitely helpful when it comes to a celestial site reduction process. So let's imagine a different situation. This time, we're gonna use, instead of a lighthouse on an island, we're gonna use a lighthouse with the sun at the very top of it. It looks kinda like the Eye of Sauron from The Lord of the Rings. And let's also imagine that the Earth is flat. I know, I have to say it, the Earth is not flat, but uh, let's imagine it is for the case of this video here. Um, we could do the same thing. We could set up, you know, an angle between us, the horizon, and the sun, and it's gonna turn into a, a big triangle that we could solve geometrically. The problem is we don't really have a chart that tells us, hey, where is the sun actually on the earth? Because it's not, it's way up in space, right? But if you were on the sun and you dropped a line down to the earth, just a little, you know, a little messenger line or something, it would impact the earth at some spot. If you were standing at that spot, you would get whacked on the head by the object from the sun, or if you looked straight up, you would see the sun up in the sky, dead, dead overhead. This spot on Earth is known as the geographic position. And it changes fast because the, uh, the Earth is of course not flat and it rotates and everything. But we do have a book that will tell us at any moment, where was the sun at the time of observation? So if you know an angle and you know a position of the, the sun, you have another angle, the height, you can calculate your distance from it kind of thing. Two problems with that, of course. Number one is, um, you know, the earth is not flat, really. And, and number two, the laws of geometry on a not flat earth are, are a little different. So we need to take that into account. So on a not flat earth or a round earth or an oblique spheroid like we are, uh, we have to, you know, use some different techniques, but the same principles do apply. There's some spot where the earth and the sun align so that the sun is directly overhead, the geographic position. It moves, we have to find it. We can measure an angle between the horizon and the, uh, the object out there. The problem is our horizon, you know, kind of extends out like that. So it's tough to, uh, it's tough to measure on a round earth kind of thing. But if you were to, you know, get on deck and, and make an observation of the sun, and you compare it to the horizon, you can definitely use this principle of triangles and distances, etc., to help you navigate. With the spherical law of cosines and sines and geometry, we're not doing regular old triangles from middle school or elementary school. We're doing spherical geometry, which sounds really cool. So technically, we're creating a spherical right triangle when we do this process. Right? And uh, if you were to, you know, kind of drop this, this line straight down to Earth and then through Earth down to the middle of the Earth, and then if you also took a line, you know, directly down from space to you, down to the middle of the Earth kind of thing, you could create a different angle on the Earth. This angle right here is known as zenith distance because your zenith is the spot right over your head. So when we do celestial navigation, although we measure one thing, we're kind of interested in something else, but it's still an angle, it's still a distance, it's, it's still related to the geometry thing. So using a different process than, than elementary school geometry, but similar, we can get results that are helpful. The problem is, another problem, there's always problems, is that we don't have a chart that's gonna show this whole area that we could work on on like a human scale, right? So we need to come up with a different method, a flow chart, a, uh, a process, a cookie cutter recipe that we can follow to get results from this principle, but using a, a process that's more human scale. So we're gonna use what's known as the Mark St. Hilaire altitude intercept method. It's the most common way to do it. We're gonna make some assumptions. We're gonna simplify a few things but the main principle still applies. We wanna know how far we were away from that geographic position. And we wanna do a few things that will help us actually figure out our position um, or a line of position from the sun. The same principles do apply. Angles, distances, 
They're all related. If we use the right formulas, if we use the right books, it's gonna be helpful. So take that same concept that we just talked about, angles, distances, etc. the sun being a lighthouse in the sky that's like really, really tall, the concept of geographic position, distance, etc., and think about it from, from space. If we're looking at the Earth, the round Earth, by the way, you know, our ship is out there floating around somewhere. And remember that there was a celestial object in the sky, the sun, star, planet, moon, and if you dropped a line down, it's gonna hit the Earth in some particular place or an observer out on the Earth is gonna see us up in space directly overhead. Do you remember the name of that, that spot on Earth? It was the geographic position. So we can find that, that's great. And then we said we create kind of angles and distances to figure stuff out, the zenith distance as it were. Um, and if you were looking down on the Earth, you could represent the zenith distance this way. And if we were just using regular old geometry for a lighthouse that was really tall with a sextant measurement, that zenith distance is going to help us determine a celestial circle of position. We would know we're somewhere along that, you know, arc, a huge arc, goes all the way around the world kind of thing. Because this zenith distance could stretch out. It could be here, it could be down here kind of thing. Just like using a radar on a lighthouse, we're creating one circle of position around the GP or the geographic position of that object, right? What if you were standing here and you observed the sun at a particular angle? As you got closer and closer to the sun, what would that angle change like? Would it get bigger? Would it get smaller kind of thing? Well, as you get closer and closer to the sun, the sun gets more and more overhead. So this St. Hilaire altitude intercept method is really just a way to say, all right, if you measure the altitude of the sun using a sextant and we do some math, ultimately we're gonna find out like, okay, are you actually where you thought you were? Or maybe are you closer or further away? As you got further and further away, the sun would get lower and lower in the sky kind of thing. So these concepts, geographic position, zenith distance, not necessary in the, the cookie cutter process, the formulas kind of thing, but it's helpful to get a big picture look at what we're achieving with a site reduction. It's gonna be one circle of position. The St. Hilaire method will allow us to take that circle, zoom it into a human scale, take a tangent of it, and turn it into a line of position. If you did the same thing with the moon, you know, if the moon dropped down right here and you created a, you know, a circle of position around the moon, you could end up with a fix that way. But for the sun, we're just going to get one circle of position or technically a tangent to that circle to get a line of position is the process. All right, so let's move on to the actual steps of the site reduction. I think you've got the background that you need. If you're looking for a deeper dive into the background, I would recommend checking out some of the other videos that are available on YouTube, um, either through my 11 part series or some of the other um, tutorials are great. So let's look at the process now. So the first step in celestial site reduction is to take a sextant, observe the sun or another celestial body, bring it to the horizon, and then make some corrections to the sextant. So in this section, we're gonna talk about that whole process. And there's quite a little bit of corrections that you need to make in order to make your observation uh, make sense and be accurate, all right? So a sextant, first of all, is a, a method of, uh, of measuring angles. We can measure an angle between anything. I can measure an angle between you know, that light and the floor. I can bring them together and I can measure the angle between them. Likewise, I could uh, maybe put my sextant sideways and I could measure an angle between the camera and my computer monitor and I can get an angle out of it that way as well. Um, the sextants are very, very useful and very precise in measuring angles. So when we think about you know, triangles and distances and all that theory, this is the tool to use it. The problem is there's a couple of corrections that you need to make when you use this sextant. So first things first, what are we looking for in the sextant? Well, if I were to look directly through this sextant, I'm gonna be looking through a telescope and then what's known as the horizon mirror. 
this horizon mirror is clear glass with a little bit of reflectivity on it so that I can see the horizon out there. Now, if I'm looking at the horizon, that's great. But if I'm looking at the sun, I'm going to burn my eyeballs out most of the time. So we've got some shades in here that will allow us to protect ourselves, just like sunglasses from the sextant. Now, if I'm looking at the horizon, that's one thing. How do I measure the, the angle to the sun? Well, if you look closely as I maneuver the sextant, you'll see that there's not one mirror, but two, right? There's a mirror here, the horizon mirror, but there's also this one, the index mirror. So as I move it around, those two mirrors move in relation to each other so that I can take the light from the sun, hit the index mirror, bounce it off the horizon mirror, and then come into my telescope that way so I can observe it. So there's also sunglasses or shades for the, uh, the, the index mirror as well. So that's kind of the principle. I'll show you a little graphic from one of my earlier videos about uh, you know, how this kind of process works. But ultimately, when you look through the sun, look through the sextant at the sun, you're gonna see a round object, unless things have changed in the solar system since then. Depending what type of mirrors you have, for instance, this sextant has what's known as a whole horizon mirror. It's not split in any way. Other sextants have split horizon mirrors or gla mirrored glass in there. So depending on what type of, uh, of mirror you have, and you can check out some other videos for, for that type of thing, you're going to take the sun and you're going to bring it down to the horizon. So eventually the sun is just sitting on the horizon. Just like that, the very bottom of the sun is touching the horizon through the sextant. When you do that, you, you've got your measurement. That's the, the time to take it. The problem is the sun is always moving, most of the time. So uh, if you did dither, you're not gonna get the uh, most precise reading. So what you wanna do is bring the sun down to the horizon, and then you wanna take your sextant and kinda rock it back and forth a little bit. Why do we do this? Well, if you look at my head, for example, I always kinda lean to the right a little bit. If you're on a boat that's moving, you've got a little bit of list and stuff in there. So that's gonna make the sun kind of do something like this as you wiggle it back and forth. And you're gonna notice that there's a gap there. You want the sun to touch the horizon just barely, just kiss the horizon, and you'll know you've got your, uh, your measurement at that point. So when you do that, you're gonna note the time to the nearest second, like very accurately, and then read the sextant. So I'm gonna write down my time. Maybe if I have a friend, I'll say Mark, and they can write down the time, whether their name is Mark or not, and, uh, and we can go from there. Okay, how about reading the sextant? Again, I've got a, a more in-depth video about reading the sextant, but in essence, along the bottom of the sextant here is the, uh, the readings, the scale. So this whole number of degrees on the gold part here, the brass part, and then inside of it, you can kind of fine tune it with the, uh, this micrometer drum to get degrees, minutes, and tenths of minutes. So again, if you're interested in a more detailed version of that, just go check out the video that I'm putting up in one of the corners of this uh, screen. But in essence, on my site with, uh, with Chuck out on the vessel, we shot the sun and we observed it at 51 degrees, 06.6 minutes above the horizon. So in this case, our boat was out there. We looked out at the horizon and we saw the sun at 51 degrees above the horizon. I don't know where the sun is. I haven't figured that out. All I know is I saw it at 51 degrees 06.6 minutes above the horizon. And that's useful information to me, right? That's useful information. But just like the sunglasses and the mirrors, there's a couple of other problems that we need to deal with before we have an actual measurement. So therefore, this is known as the HS, or the height of the sextant. The height of the sextant. It's just the raw number that kind of comes out when I make an observation. I've got the time and I've got the measurement, the height of the sextant. There's kind of three corrections we need to make to any sextant reading most of the time in order to turn it into something called HO, or height observed. That's the number we're looking for, the corrected sextant reading. 
The first correction that we need to make is known as index error. And every time you take a sextant measurement, really the first thing you should do is set your sextant to zero, make sure that it's exactly zero. All right, so we set it to zero. And then we look out at the horizon and we make sure that the horizon is flat. You wanna look out at the horizon and you wanna see an unbroken step like that. Sometimes though, depending on the type of sextant you have, there's gonna be you know, a break in the horizon as you look through the the telescope. If there's a break in the horizon like that, you have index error. And it's simply due to the fact that this is a human-made object. It's subject to heat and salt and corrosion and warping and everything. So the mirrors are slightly misaligned. You can correct that with the screws in the back of the mirrors. And if you're interested in that, you can check out some videos about uh, sextant calibration. But the, uh, the, the error needs to be removed. And as long as the error is small, like, you know, a few minutes of error, you can uh, remove it mechanically. So what you do is you take your sextant that has a break in the horizon like that, you twist the micrometer drum until it's flat and the error is gone, and then you read the value. So in my case, I took the sextant, I looked out at the horizon, I had a broken step there. So I twisted it a little bit, I got the correction um, fixed. Everything was flat, not flat earth, just flat. And then I had a reading in here that I needed to make. And it turns out from my sextant on this observation, the index error was 1.0, 1.0. Now of note, you can have index errors that go up or down because this is a kind of a, an endless machine here. And mine was one minute, one minute too high. So instead of zero, it said 1.0. So if your index error is what's known as on the arc or greater than zero, you have to take it off mechanically, just like Noah and the animals on the arc. If the index error is on the arc, take those animals off like unicorns. That's why we don't have unicorns anymore. If the index error is off the arc, you know, Put it back on by adding the, uh, the index error correction. So I take that index error, I am going to subtract 1.0, and instead of index error, now it's index correction, or IC. So I can do that math, right? 5106.6 minus 1, 51 degrees 05.6 minutes. So that's one correction that I've made to this, uh, to this sextant value. Right, there's other corrections that need to be made as well. The next correction is known as dip. Dip. And the problem with dip is kind of related to our height of eye. How tall we were on the boat. So if I was down at the, the deck level when I made my observation, you know, maybe I'm about six feet above the surface of the sea. But if I climbed up the rigging and took my observation up here, now I would be more above the horizon. I was going to make a joke about, you know, three inches or something. But, uh, but the higher you are, the more distorted your reading is due to the fact that all tables and all calculations assume that your eyeball is at sea level. If you're not at sea level, if you're above it most commonly or sometimes below it, you need to make a correction, the dip correction, otherwise known as height of eye correction. Right, and where can, we, where can we make this observation? Well, there's a table in the nautical almanac which will allow us to look up dip corrections or there's a formula, you could do it yourself, you could calculate it. Uh, so I'll show you a graphic of the, the dip correction for the nautical almanac. And for us, our dip correction is gonna be negative 2.8, negative 2.8. Right, we were only a little bit above the surface of the sea, so that's going to turn out to be 51 degrees. I'm not quite done. 51 degrees, and then 5.6 minus 2.8 is 2.8. Right. So, so far, I've taken that sextant reading, my height of sextant, and I've corrected it for index correction you know, the error in the sextant itself. 
Um, I've corrected it for my height of I above the surface of the C, and we have now what's known as HA, or height apparent. Height apparent. Remember, we were looking for HO, height observed. So there's one last correction that we need to make. It's located in what's known as the apparent altitude correction table, um, and it takes into account a couple of different corrections. First of all, if you were looking straight out at the horizon and the sun was out there, you know, it might be refracted a little bit by the atmosphere because you're looking through a lot of atmosphere when you look that way. If the sun was directly overhead, there's less atmosphere to look through. So there's some refraction based on where you are looking at the sun. Likewise, you've also got some seasonal differences. Sometimes, you know, at certain times of year, the sun is really big. Sometimes it's really small, depending on the orbit of the Earth and the Sun and the tilt of the Earth and stuff. So there's some seasonal differences. And then finally, when we observed the Sun, remember that we put the lower limb on the horizon, the lower part of the Sun. Well, the calculations are actually based on the middle of the Sun, the middle of the Sun, but it's really hard to measure that. So most commonly, we're going to measure to the bottom of the sun, the lower limb. Why do we choose the lower limb versus the upper limb? Well, most commonly, it's just easier for us to bring the sun down and have it kiss the horizon for us to make sense where we're looking at it. But you could, you could equally use the upper limb, just sink the sun below the horizon and use that. Um, more often that's used when you use the moon instead of the sun, you know, when it's kind of tilted and stuff. But, you know, if it was a partly cloudy day, you could use the upper limb. Or if you're just curious, you could do the upper limb as well. Most navigators use the lower portion of the sun on the horizon or the lower limb. So all of these corrections are kind of tied up into one thing in the apparent altitude tables. And so what we'll do when we take the apparent altitude tables is we'll take this HA and we'll look in the apparent altitude tables. We'll look in the correct season we'll look at the apparent altitude and we'll pull out a correction based on the lower limb or the upper limb, depending on which one we used. So when we do that, we see that our correction is positive 15.2 minutes. And so finally, this will allow us to get to our height observed. So I'll take the 2.8 plus 15.2 to get 18.0, 51 degrees, 18.0 minutes is my height observed. So what was the point of all of this? It's really step one in the process. You're gonna observe the sun or another body and you're gonna make some corrections. What are those corrections? For the sun, you always have an index correction for any, any body actually. Um, you've got a height of eye correction, and you've got the, uh, the apparent altitude correction as well. Apparent altitude. If you're using the moon, there's additional corrections for the parallax. If you're using a star, if you're using a planet, depending on the season, there's different corrections for each of those. But for the sun, it's going to be index correction, dip or height of eye, and then the apparent altitude correction. So if you notice, our sextant height was 5106.6 when we looked through the sextant. With all these corrections, it's 5118.0. What does that mean? Is that a big number? Is that a small number? A big difference? A small difference? Well, it's about you know, 12 miles of accuracy when the time comes. So depending on how accurate you're trying to be, if you're out there on the open ocean, you know, you could you could round these, you could ignore them if you wanted to, but to be most precise, you want to make these corrections. So that's step one, observe and then correct the sextant to get a height observed. Next, we'll move on to step two. Step two of our process is going to be called finding the object that we shot, right? The geographic position of the sun. So find the sun is a good way to think about it. So when we made that observation of the sun, we were sitting on our boat. Our boat was, you know, out here somewhere floating along in the ocean and we measured an altitude to the sun. We can put that altitude aside for a while. What we need to know now is where was the sun at the time of observation? 
If you remember the name of that spot directly beneath the sun, or if you were standing there, the sun was directly overhead, what we're looking for is the geographic position of the sun at the moment of observation. So for us, we were shooting this in the afternoon. We shot the sun, you know, so if we were to represent it this way, the sun would be maybe right there. That would be its geographic position. We need to find it precisely. We need to find it precisely. The trouble with geographic position is that it's not just latitude and longitude or, or distance and range kind of thing. We need to define a couple other terms to go along with this. And first things first, the latitude of the geographic position, that's pretty easy. How far north or south of the equator is that spot? It's known as declination. Declination is the latitude of the spot directly beneath the sun or the latitude of the GP. If you think about the sun in particular, over the course of the year, the sun's declination is going to change. So for example, on the equinox, when we have equal days and equal nights, that's what equinox means, the declination is zero. It's at the equator. In the northern hemisphere summer, the declination increases until around June 21st, where it reaches its solstice where the sun stands still and then begins to change in declination to the winter summer solstice and back and forth. So this declination changes. It doesn't change very quickly, but it does change. So we can look up the declination of the sun for the time of observation. Likewise, we need to find the longitude of the geographic position as well. Looking at a globe, there's no easy way to figure that out, but like Latitude and longitude, we're going to rely on Greenwich as our kind of main spot. So if that's Greenwich, England, that's the zero longitude on Earth. If you go west of it, you're going to hit the geographic position, um, and that's its longitude. The only difference, though, for celestial navigation is that geographic position's longitude, otherwise known as Greenwich hour angle, or GHA, only ever increases to the west. There's no east, there's no west, it just increases to the west from zero to 360. So for, for an example here, what we're saying is that uh, the geographic position of the sun is, you know, this far to the west of Greenwich. What about if it was right here? What if the geographic position was right there? You can't just say, all right, it's that far east of Greenwich. No, no. You go from Greenwich all the way around the Earth to get the Greenwich hour angle that way. So that's the difference between longitude and Greenwich hour angle, is that Greenwich hour angle increases from 0 to 360. There's no east and west. It always just goes to the west. So why is it called hour angle? or GHA. What does that mean? Why isn't it just called longitude? Well, if you were to take the North Pole, or what's known in celestial nav terms as the elevated pole, the closer one to your ship, you can actually create this angle that they're talking about. That is GHA, Greenwich Hour Angle. It's measured in degrees and minutes, just like other, any other type of angle. So for this step, we're interested in knowing the declination and the GHA of the GP, the geographic position of the sun. Where do we do that? We look it up in the Nautical Almanac. It's tricky, there's some nuance to it, but big picture, we're looking for the declination and the GHA of that spot. Why do we care about that? Well, if we know that spot and we know the angle that we observed it in step one, we can do everything. We can figure out how far we were away from it, we can do angles and distances, etc., cetera, to, uh, to help us figure out our position. So in order to do that, we've got to find the declination and GHA of the geographic position. We'll go to the Nautical Almanac for that. So the first thing we'll do in the Nautical Almanac is flip to the day that we made our observation. We made our observation on the 29th of May. So there's three days worth of data in this table, but we're on the 29th of May. And if we look at that page, we'll notice that all of the information for the sun and the moon is on one particular page. And here's the sun information for Saturday, 29 May. Here's the Greenwich hour angle 
and the declination for the time of observation in hours. So if it was midnight GMT, the GHA would be 180 and the declination would be 21 and some change. We made our observation at 20.07.30 GMT on the 29th of May. So if I look down here at, uh, at 20 hundred hours, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see better. I can pull off the GHA and declination for the time of observation. The problem is we didn't observe the sun directly at 8 o'clock, 20 hundred GMT. We observed it at 2007 point and, and a half, 2007 and 30 seconds. So what I'll do first is I'll write down the whole values of GHA and declination. The GHA value is 120 degrees, 37.8. That only accounts for the 20 hours, 20 hundred. We have another seven minutes and 30 seconds to account for. So if you look at the rate of change between hour 20 and hour 21, you can see that the GHA changes by about 15 degrees per hour. The earth turns in 24 hours. There's 360 degrees in a circle. So each hour, the sun is gonna move about 15 degrees. In terms of declination, you can see that it doesn't really change that much. So you could theoretically do a mental interpolation and say, okay, well, at 20 hundred hours, the declination is north 21, 44.7. And at 21 hours, it's north 21, 45.0. Doesn't change that much. You can probably estimate it. But if you want to calculate it for reals, look at this little D number here. That's the rate of change of declination. So we'll use that when we go later to the back of the book to make our correction. So once we've got this information written down, we'll kind of uh, you know, write down the declination and the GHA values, and then we're gonna go to the back of the book, the increments and corrections table. The increments and corrections allow us to account for that extra seven minutes, the extra seven minutes and 30 seconds that the sun was moving since the whole value of 20 hundred hours was in there. So in seven minutes and 30 seconds, the sun is gonna change its GHA by one degree, 52.5 minutes. And with that little D number, that value correction, we simply look up the 0 0.4 that we wrote down and the declination is gonna change by 0 0.1 minutes over the course of that seven minutes and 30 seconds. So an angular change in GHA here and an angular change in declination here needs to be added or sometimes subtracted for declination to the tabulated values here. So again, that's where you find the little D number, the rate of change of declination. So first step is write these down. Second step is correct them for increments and corrections. And then you'll get a total correction that way. So we'll go to the whiteboard just to write all this stuff down. So when it comes to writing this stuff down, usually what I'll do is I'll write declination and I'll take the tabulated value for the day in question. I'll write down the little D number. That's the rate of change of declination from hour to hour. Since we have to account for those extra seven minutes and 30 seconds, we need to do this. And back in the increments and corrections table, the little D number correction was 0.1. So I have a total declination of north 2144.8. How do I know to add? Well, the rate of change of declination in the tables is increasing because it's springtime in the Northern Hemisphere, but you can also just look at the tables and see that it's increasing. So changes need to be added. For Greenwich hour angle, I have my tabulated value of 120.37.8. In the increments and corrections table, I had 152.5. Do I add or subtract that? I always add GHA because GHA is always west of Greenwich. It's always increasing. It never, never changes course. So when I do my math, I, I tend to forget degrees. So that's why I write down 121.90.3, which I convert to 122.30.3 because there's 60 minutes in an hour. Math is your weak point here. If you mess up anything here, it's gonna screw up your whole site. So it's worth double checking, um, double checking your process there. So step two is now complete. We found the geographic position of the sun. We know we're out there somewhere. We found the declination and the GHA. 
the Greenwich hour angle of the sun. That'll allow us to move on to the next step where we're gonna construct some triangles and then further solve them. So, so far in step one, we observed the sun, we corrected it for three things, and we have a height observed that we can use. In step two, we found the geographic position of the sun, its declination, and its longitude or Greenwich hour angle. We're going to fall back on our very first discussion in this video about geometry and triangles for step three, which is to build a spherical triangle. We know a couple of points of this triangle. We've got the GP of the sun. That's kind of like our anchor point. It's got a declination and a GHA. We also know the North Pole. That's up there. It's a fixed point and it's our elevated pole. Finally, we've got our ship's position. We don't know where we are, otherwise we would be not doing celestial navigation if we were just using our GPS. But a good navigator is always going to maintain a dead reckoning position. A dead reckoning position is a deduced position where you think you are based on your course and your speed. It could be based on old information from yesterday or the day before, but you always have some idea of where you were. And so in our case, our dead reckoning position was at um, a, a latitude of 32 degrees north and a longitude, that's the symbol for longitude, lambda, of 80 degrees west. So I didn't know where I was exactly, but I had a good idea, 3280. That's where we were on that day, on Saturday, the uh, 29th of May at 20. 0730 GMT. That was my best guess. So I do actually have a spot there and it's called my dead reckoning position or uh, what I can do is I can kind of tweak that a little bit to turn it into what's known as an assumed position for math purposes. But to start out with we've got our our dead reckoning position. So this is our latitude you know, right there is our latitude, our distance north of the equator. But our longitude is actually very important in this case. So longitude is an angular distance west or east of Greenwich. So longitude is west or east, east and west. But Greenwich hour angle is only west, right? So if I kind of figure out my longitude here, so I've written down my lambda for longitude, I can kind of come up with another angle that's gonna be helpful as we like build a triangle, so to speak. And that angle is kind of the difference between GHA and my longitude right here. This angle right there. Why is that important to know? Well, if ultimately I'm building a triangle between the GP, myself, and the North Pole, Right? If I build that triangle, it's very similar in principle to that lighthouse. We built a triangle, you know, kind of up and down this way for the lighthouse. We're just kind of flopping it on its side, but we're using the same principle. If we can build a triangle and use some angles and some sides, we can solve the rest of the triangle and help us deduce our position. So this triangle right here represents a connection between my dead reckoning position, the geographic position of the sun, and the North Pole. So knowing this blue angle right here is, uh, is helpful because if I build a triangle, I need to know some legs and some sides in order to do that. This is known as local hour angle or LHA. So if you look at that, you can say that LHA is equal to GHA minus longitude. LHA is equal to GHA minus longitude. Whatever's left is LHA. This only applies in the Western Hemisphere, in the Western Hemisphere. If you're in the Eastern Hemisphere, it's LHA equals GHA plus easterly longitude. In this case, we're going to focus on the Western Hemisphere. So LHA is GHA minus longitude. Why do I need that? Well, again, we're kind of building a triangle here. We're going to solve it in the next step. But in order to do that, I need to quantify my LHA. Right? I need to quantify my LHA. And so if I take my GHA, which we determined in the last step, and I take my assumed longitude, I can come up with something. Right? So our, our GHA 
from step two was uh, 122.30.3. And my dr longitude was 80 degrees west. So GHA minus longitude will give me my LHA. Now here is where you need to make a critical decision about the process that you want to follow from here. So you can make, you can do this problem in two different ways. If you want to do direct calculations with your calculator using sines and cosines and solving this triangle manually with a calculator or with haversines or logarithm tables if you're old school you can just uh, subtract these and LHA can be you know an imprecise number for example if we did this um, math 122 30.3 minus 80 is going to give us an LHA of 42 degrees 30.3 minutes. That's my LHA. So I could file that away as a little piece of information that I use later, this precise angle. The other way to do it, if you're not going to solve it directly with a calculator, but instead if you're going to use tables, the most popular way to do it is, um, is to look in tables. And the tables are known as HO229 or HO249, just kind of uh, books that you can get for navigation which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. But if you're gonna use that book, unfortunately, the LHA needs to be a whole number. It needs to be a whole number. But that's okay, right? Because our DR longitude was just some random spot that we were close to. It's not our exact longitude. We said it was 80. What if I said my DR was 8001? Would that make a difference? Not really, right? So our DR longitude can be any number that we want as long as it's close to our, our actual longitude, right? You can't pick something on the other side of the planet. So uh, if I have an estimated position of 80 degrees west, and if I need a whole number of LHA to pop out of this in order to use the tables, well, I can just change my DR longitude. What if I said my DR longitude was 80.30.3? What happens then? Well, my LHA is a whole number, 42 degrees. So um, when you assume your, your DR longitude, you wanna do it so that you result in a whole number of LHA if you're gonna use the tables. If you're doing it with direct calculation, you just subtract GHA minus longitude and you get your LHA. Again, why do we care about this? We're getting an angle for this triangle that we're building. So our LHA is gonna be 42. We are gonna use HO229 to solve this problem, um, but I will show you in a little annex about how to calculate this directly. So if you, if you like to do that directly, you can skip ahead to that point of the video. Remember, there's little timestamps down below that you can look at this. Uh, but for us, we've got an LHA of 42. What else do we need to do to build this triangle? Well, we need to kind of assume where we were. We already did that for longitude. Our latitude is 32 north. So check, I've got that corner of the triangle locked down. I've got this corner of the triangle locked down, and I've got this corner of the triangle locked down as well. So I've built this triangle to go from there. So the next step is going to be to actually solve that triangle using the tables in HO229. That can be a tricky process. So review everything that we've done so far before we kind of move on. But our next step is going to be step number four, solving the triangle. In this step of the process, we're going to solve this triangle. But before we get into the mechanics of it, I thought we could just review um, kind of the geometry of what's going on. When I say solve the triangle, we're going to take some information about this triangle that we built in step three, and we're gonna feed it into a calculator. Either we're gonna do it directly ourselves by memorizing or looking up the formulas, or we're gonna look in a publication for the values. Either way, we feed the computer, the calculator or the book, some information and it gives us the rest of it. So we are gonna feed it the dead reckoning latitude, this value right here. Why that? It's not even part of the triangle, right? 
But the calculator and the formula and the book knows that if you have your latitude here, the complement of it is this leg right here, known as the co-latitude. So they, they don't make you solve that directly. They don't make you say 90 minus your latitude to get the co-latitude. They kind of do it in the calculator and in the formula. Likewise, we're going to give it the declination. We're only going to give it the whole value of declination, though, because the book, the calculator, um, you know, it relies on whole values. If you are doing direct calculations by hand, you can just type in the declination and it's going to be good. But again, this is the declination of the sun. That's not part of our triangle. But this is co-declination, the opposite, the complement of the declination. The formula, the book are smart enough to know if you tell it this, what you really mean is this. And finally, we're taking the LHA, the local hour angle from the calculation that we did in step number three. So if you think about it from geometry, think back to the lighthouse. If you know two sides and an angle or two angles and a side, you can get the rest of the results out of it. So we're in essence giving the calculator, the formula or the book, this leg, this angle and this leg right there. And it's going to spit back some other information out to us. All right, so that's the theory behind it. If you're doing it by hand, by actual calculation with a calculator or with a Haversign table or logarithm tables, great. You're just going to type in some stuff. If you're looking this up in HO229 or HO249, you're going to need to feed it latitude, declination, and LHA. It's going to spit back some results. What is it going to spit back? Well, it's going to spit back something known as HC or computed height. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you were sitting here with your sextant on your boat and you observed the sun up there in the sky, that is your HO, your height observed. We did that way back in step one. But what the, what the calculator is going to tell you, the process is going to tell you, it's like, all right, you may have observed that, that's fine. but if you were actually at this position right there, if you were actually there based on the information you told me, you should have observed the sun at this angle, HC, a computed angle. So clearly there's a difference, right? So that means clearly you're not at that spot. And that's how we navigate. We compare something that we calculated to something that we observed and we can work out the difference and use that to our advantage. So don't be discouraged if your numbers don't necessarily work out or if there's a difference between these two. The difference should be small, but it should be real. So a computed height is what the, what the formula, what the book says is like, all right, if you were actually in this triangle, if you were actually at that corner of the triangle, you should have observed the sun at this particular angle, this computed height. Later, we're going to compare it and go from there. The other thing that the formula is going to give you is uh, azimuth. Remember way back when we talked about bearings to a lighthouse using a compass? Well, in celestial terms, the word azimuth is a bearing. So if I was taking an observation of the sun, I should see it at a particular bearing or a particular azimuth. So the computer or the formula or the book is in essence telling you this angle, Z for azimuth. Now, again, we have to tweak the, the formulas a little bit to make it work because technically they're giving you this angle right there. But, uh, but the point is, if you give it two sides and an angle, it's going to give you back some other information. It's going to give you this azimuth angle and it's going to give you kind of this leg of the triangle so that you can then go and plot it on a chart and figure out the difference between what you observed and what you measured to help you navigate. We'll do that in step five. But first, let's kind of go over the math of uh, solving this triangle using both the, the manual calculations and the table HO229. So we've worked very hard to build this triangle and we've given some information to the calculator or to the tables and we're expecting some information back. We're expecting a computed height and a bearing or an azimuth to it. In other words, a distance and an angle down to this bottom part of the triangle. If you are interested in the direct calculations, it's less commonly done, but it is pretty quick. And in this case, we're just going to take a formula. The sine of the computed height is equal to the sine of the latitude 
times the sine of the declination. And by the way, don't forget that you're going to do the entire declination, not just the, the whole value, plus the cosine of the latitude, the cosine of the declination, and the cosine of the LHA. And again, you're doing the entire LHA, not just the whole number, if you refer back to what we talked about then. Likewise, the z, the azimuth, the angle, is equal to the sine of the declination minus the sine of the latitude times the sine of the computed height, all divided by the cosine of the latitude times the cosine of the computed height. It doesn't take that long to actually type this stuff in if you know how to use your calculator, and it's gonna result in an angle of 265.5. So that's telling us that 265.5 degrees and we should have seen the sun at 50 degrees, 57.5. If we did, we're exactly at that spot. If we didn't, we have to make a correction. The more common way of doing these is using the tables. Using the tables. And we're gonna use table HO229 for this. It's a perpetual table. You can download it or you can uh, have a copy of it if you want. And we're gonna take this information right here, dead reckoning latitude of 32, declination of 21, and we're gonna kind of ignore that leftover for now, but we'll have to come back to it later. And the LHA of 42, we're gonna give that to the calculator, to the book, and it's gonna give us something back. Likewise, if we're using the tables, HO229, we give it those three pieces of information. We give it an LHA of 42, we give it a latitude of 32, and we give it a declination of 21. It spits out some information for us. It spits out a computed height of 5106.1 and a computed azimuth of 95.8 in there, as well as a little D number. That D number is, uh, is just a correction factor. It's 25.2, if you wanted to, to write that down as well. So what do we do with that information? Well, it's different than the direct calculations because we fed different information into the computer, this book, right? We gave it a whole value of declination and a whole value of LHA. Both had the whole value of latitude, but that's fine. So that's why there's a difference between the tabulated value and the, uh, the direct computed value. You're gonna do one or the other. You're either gonna do the tables or the direct calculation. A couple of notes. Uh, triangles work the same way right side up as they do upside down. On a sphere, that's gonna allow this table to have less pages if you just kind of solve triangles once and, and ask us to make some corrections. So one correction that they ask us to make is that in northerly latitudes, if our LHA is less than 180, then we have to take 360 minus this Z number here in order to get the, um, the, the true azimuth that we want. And likewise, we have to correct using this little 25.2 number, the fact that we did not um, actually type in the, the true uh, declination. We used a whole value of declination instead, right? So uh, we have to make a couple of tweaks to it, but bottom line, we're gonna take this information and we're gonna write it down on the whiteboard and then do our, our final little tweaks. So we took that information out of the tables and we're just dropping it right here onto the whiteboard. So we've got our computed height of 5106.1, that little D number of 25.2, and our azimuth of 95.8. Let's start here. I showed you in the, uh, the HO229 tables that if our LHA is less than 180, we have to make some changes to it. All they're saying is this triangle here would work the same way if it were backwards. So to save pages, this angle here is 95.8, but on a navigational chart, we're truly interested in that angle, right? So all we have to do is take 360 minus this value here and we're gonna get Zn, or our true azimuth. So 360 minus 95.8 gives us a true azimuth of 264.2 degrees true. Why is that useful? Well, now we know this angle right there in, in navigational terms. Mathematical terms, it's that. Navigational terms, it's that. So we could plot that on a chart. We know exactly the bearing from our assumed position to the sun. We could plot that on a chart. It's gonna be helpful and we'll do that in the next step. For this value right here, the computed height, it's telling us if we were standing there, how high should the sun have been in the sky? And we'll compare that to what we actually observed. That's the essence of the navigation. The problem is that in order to use HO229, we told it that the declination was just 21, but we do have to account for this little 
hanger on of the declination there. As an example, if you're interested, look at the tables for declination of 22. You'll see that there is a difference there. The difference here is this, uh, this difference factor, this uh, intercept factor. And uh, you can solve this a couple of different ways. The way that I like to think about it is, all right, 44.8. If you took 44.8, the little hanger on, divided by 60, that's the, the ratio of how far you are from declination 21 to declination 22. If you do that and you multiply it by 25.2, that's all you gotta do. That's your correction. So your correction comes out to be 18.8 minutes added. So I take the, the leftover declination, divide it by 60, multiply it by this correction factor, and you've got what you need. There's also a way to do this in HO229 and on other, other tables as well that gives you a table to look up that, uh, that correction. If you don't like that uh, method that I showed you, you can, you can check that as well. But once we correct this HC, once we tweak this triangle ever so slightly for our true declination, we end up with a computed height of 51 degrees and 24.9 minutes. So if we were standing or floating at this assumed position, the assumed position was, you know, this latitude 32 and the, the longitude we needed to get our declination. If we were standing there, we could look on our compass at 264.2. Okay, got it. And I could look up in the sky using my sextant on that bearing to 5124.9 and I should see the sun. If I do, great. That's exactly my ship's position. More than likely, you're not. You're gonna take this and compare it to what you observed and you'll find out that you're close to that position but not quite there and we've got it. That's our line of position. So in the next step, we'll kind of review that, we'll plot it and we'll go from there. So the last step in our process, step number five, is to compare and plot this solution. What we've been waiting for, this single line of position that we can use to navigate. So if we take that big triangle and we just zoom in on the corner near us, here's our ship's position, our DR position, our approximate position or our assumed position. That's the spot that we assumed we were at when we used the tables or did the calculation. When we said we were there, we typed that into the formula or we looked it up in the book and it said, okay, if you're there, you're gonna look at a bearing of 264.2 and you'll see the sun on that bearing. Likewise, you should have observed the sun at an altitude of 5124.9 if you're on that spot. If you're not on that spot, we have to compare. Okay, well, that's great. We observed the sun at a bearing of uh, 50, 51 degrees, 18.0. Not that, it was different, right? So our HO was 51 degrees, 18.0 minutes. So what's the difference between those two? What's the difference between those two? Well, it turns out that the difference between them is 6.9 minutes of arc. The computed value was 5124.9. The observed value was 5118.0. The difference is 6.9. That minutes of arc, because we live on a sphere, means that it's 6.9 nautical miles away from that spot, which is awesome because we can use that to navigate, right? However, we need to know, are we closer to the sun or further from the sun in this case? Well, if we observed it at 5118 and the computed value was 5124.9, we're further away from the sun. Why is that? The sun is lower in the sky. If I moved even further back, if I observed it at 50 degrees or 49 degrees or 48 degrees or 10 degrees or zero degrees, we're further away from the sun. So we are away from this position. And the way that we're gonna do this on the chart is we're gonna plot this position. We're gonna plot the bearing 264.2, but also in the other direction. And we'll say, all right, 6.9 nautical miles away from the sun. Here's the sun. So we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. Right there, 
is our line of position. So altitude intercept method, altitude intercept method, right? Big picture, if we then kind of zoom out back to the big world, what actually have we done? We said our ship was here, the sun was over here, the North Pole is up here. So what we did is we took that assumed position, we just tweaked it ever so slightly and said, hey, we're actually away a little bit. And that means that this circle of position around the sun is, is somewhere where we are. We're somewhere on that line. Um, if we had the moon, if we had a star, we could cross them to get a fix that way. But all that this method, this altitude intercept method tells us is where the line of position is for the sun or the circle of position. Since it's a circle of position, we take a tangent of that circle and we plot that on the chart and we represent it. We say, okay, sun 200730 on our chart. We could use that later to advance or to retard a line of position uh, to get an, an estimated position or a running fix. We could use the moon, like I say, to get, uh, to get a fix. But all of that work gave us one line of position. So if you have a nautical chart, you can plot it on the chart. If you have a universal plotting sheet, in other words, your own chart, you can plot it on there. So let's take a look at the universal plotting sheet, how to actually plot the solution. But big picture, it's going to be to plot the assumed position or the dead reckoning that we used. And we're going to plot either towards or away 264.2 a certain distance, 6.9 nautical miles. We'll draw our line and that is our LOP. Setting up a universal plotting sheet is really just creating your own chart. So if you had a real nautical chart, you could just plot directly on that. But usually out in the open ocean, we're gonna use these universal plotting sheets. The reason they're universal is because latitude is conserved. If you go from the equator north or from the equator south, your latitude lines are never really gonna change. So to use the universal plotting sheet, we're gonna kind of assume a central latitude. Our dead reckoning latitude was 32 degrees north. So we'll call that 32. So that makes this 31 degrees north or 33 degrees north, et cetera. And if you want some more detail on these universal plotting sheets, I do have a, a full video just on those. The other thing though about the universal plotting sheet is that longitude is not conserved. So if you were at say latitude 90, the longitude lines would be super small because they converge as you go towards the pole. Likewise, if you were at latitude zero at the equator, longitude lines would be really far apart. There's two ways to, uh, to kind of draw the longitude lines in to create our own chart. The quick and dirty method is to take your central latitude and just drop a point there and a point there, connect the dots and you've got your longitude. The official best way to do it though is to take this mid latitude down here and draw it right where yours is, 32 for example. Then take the distance from one end to the other, I realize I drew it slightly crooked, sorry, and that's going to be your longitude mark. But you'll see that they're equivalent for most latitudes. So uh, only when you get to kind of severe latitudes does that actually matter. So we can drop these in. We could do the same thing on the other side. You know, maybe we'll use the, the dividers for this one. Drop in a longitude. And we can pick these longitudes to be anything that we want as well. So our dead reckoning longitude was 80 degrees west. And we used 80 degrees 30 for our um, assumed longitude. So we want to make sure that we're somewhere in there. So let's say that this is 80 degrees west, this is 81 degrees west, and 82 degrees west, because longitudes increase that way. All right, so the next step is to plot our assumed position, that corner of the triangle that we kind of anchored ourselves on. Well, the latitude is easy, it was 32 degrees north, and the longitude was, um, we assumed our longitude was 80 degrees 30.3. So I'll take the dividers, and I'll set up my longitude scale down here, 30, and a little bit over zero, 30.3. 
and I can kind of plot my longitude that way. So this right here is my AP, my assumed position. So if we drew this like the corner of the triangle that we were solving earlier, you know, the North Pole would be that way and the sun would be somewhere over here. What angle is the sun at? Well, we measured that earlier, or we calculated it earlier. It's going to be 264.2. So I can set my triangle up to 264.2 or so. I can bring it to my AP and draw the sun out that way. Right, so the sun would be that way. We just created a small corner of that triangle. Then, uh, just because it's technique, I'll continue that line in the opposite direction slightly. And that was a bearing of 264.2 towards the sun. We calculated in the last um, whiteboard discussion that it was 6.9 miles away. So I'm just going to measure 6.9 or 7 miles away. So I'll put one end on the metal tip and I'll go 6.9 miles away from the sun. I'll take a perpendicular line to that azimuth line. And that represents the sun at 20.07.30. That's my line of position or technically my circle of position, a tangent to it. All right, so if I had the moon, I could do that again and get a fix. If I could advance this with a running fix, that would be great. Um, but that's the process for plotting these out. Again, if you want some more on the universal plotting sheet or techniques here, check out some of the other videos on that um, for the basics. Holy smokes, that was a long process, right? Well, with time, it gets quicker and you can uh, kind of learn the process by doing it. I find that many students, if they do this five times with observations that they make, they've got it down and it sticks forever. The nice part about the sun reduction process is it's the basic recipe for any celestial site. If you want to do a star, do it just like we did, just make a little tweak. You want to do the moon, just like we did, a small change. A planet, just like we did, a small change. So getting the sun site reduction process down is great. In this video, we talked about the altitude intercept method of Mark St. Hilaire. And uh, the, the five steps that I think are, are the best way to remember this is number one, shoot and correct the sextant. So we're going to observe the body, you know, using our mirrors, we're going to correct it for index error, which is the error in the sextant. We'll correct it for dip, our height of eye, and we'll correct it for the altitude correction, the semi diameter and refraction. Then we're going to find the geographic position the declination and the GHA of the sun. We'll use the nautical almanac to do that and we'll get it very precisely. Then we'll build a triangle. We'll use our dead reckoning position, our LHA and the geographic position of the sun to build a triangle and take some information from it. Whether we do direct calculations or use HO229 or HO249, we need that information to solve the triangle, which is step four. We feed some information into a formula or to a book and it spits back some information. It says, okay, if you're standing at that assumed position, you should have seen the sun at a certain altitude and a certain azimuth. If you did, great. If not, you have to do a little bit of tweaks to your triangle. So you're going to compare what you observed to what you calculated and then plot the difference on a chart. And that will allow us to have our celestial line of position. So this video was long. It's a long process. I appreciate you sticking with it. Like I say, do a bunch of them on your own and you'll feel much more confident from there. Other resources you have available to you uh, on YouTube or in my, my classes, I've got uh, free and reduced price celestial nav courses that you can check out if you want. Or uh, really just look on the internet. There's all kinds of good stuff. There's other good videos on YouTube if you like things explained in a different way. So check those out. Just build your understanding, but most importantly, do it. The best way to learn is by doing. Thanks for watching. Happy navigating.